Sorry, sorry, can everybody speak up a bit because of the air conditioning? Sorry. Um, what do big people say that the reason people like Jacob Well, I would say yes. You see in South Africa, they have a lovely phrase, which um, when, whenever you criticize any of the party elite, like Jacob Zuma, who went through a, a rape trial, who was, was shown to have links to a convicted fraudster in South Africa, and who also has five wives, when you criticize somebody like that, then many people within the ANC come out and say, you are practicing what is known as reverse racism. Now, there's no such thing as reverse racism. There's racism, and that is it. Reverse racism to me is black acceptance or any other acceptance of another superiority. That is reverse racism, because you're being racist towards yourself. You know? So, yes, they are, but you see the South African, the apartheid was terrible. You know, apartheid was really terrible. And the longer you went, the longer you, you, you start to interrogate what apartheid was about, then you begin to appreciate how terrible it was. Because I was explaining to, to, to John and another group the other night that they used to have tests to, to test your race. It was a really basic test. They would measure your nose, they would measure your lips, they shove a pencil in your head, and depending on how fast that pencil fell out of your head, uh, would determine whether you stayed with your family or not. Because if there were other members of your family where the pencil fell on the floor pretty quickly, and yours was stuck, you were stuck, you would be separated from your family. You would be declared an other. <coughs> so people like Jacob Zuma and uh, Peter de Villiers, Look, and I happen to know Peter de Villiers personally, and Peter de Villiers incidentally is the only coach in South Africa who went through all the, the coaching structures, uh, formal coaching structures. I think his problem is probably his mouth. He's not a good PR person. But it, it, it is inconceivable, regardless of how good a person will be, if they are white in South Africa. As far as I can see it at this stage, I might be wrong. I don't see them winning an election in South Africa because people will say that a white person back in power in South Africa is going to reintroduce apartheid. And that's the bottom line. Yeah, hi, thanks. I enjoyed both of your speeches and the film was really interesting as well. Um, I'm a, I've just finished a master's degree looking at the effect of sanctions placed by Australia, New Zealand and Europe and Fiji. I'm really interested now in, the, in thinking about the impact of sporting sanctions that have been placed on Fiji's rugby team here at the World Cup. I was just interested in listening to your um, point of views about the efficacy of these sporting sanctions in Fiji. I know they're quite different than the 1981 tour, but I think there's been a lot of um, similarities that people are saying about Fiji. And I just wanted to hear your opinions about that. Well, um, <coughs> I mean, it's a good question. I think the first thing to remember is that sporting sanctions came on in South Africa because the majority in South Africa wanted those sanctions. They said to New Zealand and, and the whole world, we don't want you to send guns over, we don't want you to fight, come and, come and, and liberate us with arms. The best thing you can do from New Zealand and you know, around the world is to put a boycott on, to bring real pressure for change. And whenever you have boycotts, they're by far the most, the most uh, effective boycott is a sports boycott because that, that hits the psychology of every person in the country. I mean, in the case of South Africa, we used to run these campaigns to stop buying South African goods. You know, South African apricots used to come over here. And it was, it was always very hard to get consumer boycotts of those things, because people don't look at the labels on, on the shelves of supermarkets. But people used to go in, you know, the dried apricots in the plastic bags. People would go in um, with their keys and just rip them open and, uh, and what have you, just leave them on the shelf or, or take a whole pile into your shopping basket and take them down to the deep freeze and 
put them underneath the, um, you know. So, you know, and a lot of um, things were, there were a lot of products were destroyed in that way. But that, that boycott never had any real impact at all. It had a very low public profile. When you talk about sport, everybody's involved. So sports boycotts are incredibly effective. Now, in the case of Fiji, there's been some, some, some talk now about what, what we might do when the Fijian team comes over here and plays. And uh, they were here in Dunedin last week. But some of the groups now are saying, um, I was talking to one, um, someone from the Coalition for Democracy in Fiji, saying uh, it may be time for us to do a, have a protest during the Fiji at, at the World Cup. Um, about 10 years ago, a whole pile of us went down to Wellington, came down here for the sevens. Fiji were playing. We had a, we had a, a really good protest outside. And I think that those kinds of things have, have a big impact inside Fiji. But we have to be careful. What do the people of Fiji want? What do they feel is the most effective way that we can support them? And um, if, they, if they believe a sports boycott is effective, then we should respond to that. Honey should give, a, should give another one. But um, I think the, why is it taking so long? There's, um, there have been a lot of iterations along the way. Um, you know, there have been different groups formed on, on the left to try and, to try and fight neoliberalism, you know? And this is the, the terrible scourge that, that you people have been inflicted with. I mean, when I came to university, it was completely free. It was free education. We didn't have student loans. And when I went to, to teachers college, I was paid a salary to, to train as a, as, a, as a teacher. I never had to, um, I worked over Christmas holidays and that was enough money to support me through, through the year. And so we go out with no student loan. And I was expected, it was expected of me that I would be in a higher paid job. And so therefore, I would pay higher taxes through the rest of my life. And that would be my way of contributing to my kids' education. But what that didn't happen in the 1980s, our generation, the baby boomers, what we did was we took massive tax cuts for, for certainly the wealthy baby boomers and then required our own kids to pay for their own education. If you look at it in a generational sense, it's incredibly selfish what happened. But in fact, we shouldn't see it in a generational sense. We should see it in a class sense because, in fact, the changes from 1984 when Labor introduced um, its... Uh, it's neoliberal policies. It just sucked money from the poor, from the poor to the rich. And just today, we had the announcement of the, the rich list. Right now, the rich list, the top 100 people in New Zealand, their wealth increased from 28 million, 28 billion, to 35 billion. Seven billion dollars increase. Okay. Now, if you took that seven billion dollars increase, so we're not taking their wealth, we're just taking the increase in their wealth then we could almost double the wages for every person in New Zealand who's earning under $15 an hour. Now think about that. Half a million New Zealanders could have their standard of living dramatically improved with just the top 100 people giving up their increase in wealth each year. Now what mana, I mean that, that's really the, the guts of it, I think for me. And mana has policies to say, Tax is a huge thing. The, you know, you can look at a country, you can look at all of their policies, and you can say, um, you know, good, bad, or whatever. But in fact, if you can look at just one policy, the economic policy, then you get an idea of where that country's going. And our economic policy in New Zealand is stuffed. And we have to have a shift in taxation from the poor to the rich, because even, every time GST is increased, that's the poor take the brunt of that. Tax has been transferred onto the poor in, in New 
New Zealand and away from the rich. We've got to reverse that. And we've got to have the Honeheke tax, which is a you know tax on financial transactions. Um, we, we tax uh, uh, death, bring reintroduce death duties to New Zealand. These are taxes that even that even the Americans have these taxes. Even Americans pay death duty. New Zealanders don't. And so we've got to we've got to reintroduce these things. There'll be an enormous amount of income then that's available for, for genuine development in, in the in the community. Uh, I could go on, but I won't. I sound like a politician if I go on. <laughs>